Hi everybody, it's Pastor Eric and it's good to be with you again for our midweek check-in. Uh, I have a word for you. Um, as always, I believe the words that I share will be uh, a blessing to you because uh, I ask the Holy Spirit to speak to me that I might speak to you, the things of God. Uh, and this message is, uh, is one that I think is very, very pertinent for the moment that we're in, especially here in the United States and especially as it pertains to the church, Christians in America. So let's pray and let's get right into the Word of God. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come before your throne once again, listening with ears and hearts and minds open to what you would reveal to us in the Spirit and uh, what you would use me to reveal to your children in the Spirit, dear God. Let it be said that that which is shared today is the Word of God and the applications are those that are consistent and derived from that word. So Father, bless this time together. Bless every listening ear and every open heart. And uh, as I always say, let there be a blessing on the reading, the hearing, the acknowledging, the declaring, and mostly the doing of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks again, once again, for being with me tonight. Um, and uh, I, I want to share a word that's, that I entitle, Avoiding Those Tasty Trifles. And I'll show you what I mean here in a moment when I talk about tasty trifles. Um, in two places in the Proverbs, Solomon says the same thing. And there are, there's, there's at least one other passage that he repeats, uh, one other verse that he repeats in the Proverbs. But in the 31 chapters of Proverbs, these words are repeated uh, in Proverbs 18.8. And in also Proverbs 26, 22, they both say exactly the same thing. Solomon tells us, the words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles. They go down to the inmost body. <laughs> and uh, we don't use the term tasty trifles very often. But what I think of is I think of those things that, that we eat, those things that are, that, that are offered to us, so for instance, like hors d'oeuvres. Uh, uh, things that are that are uh, meant to kind of kind of uh, fill the space between uh, between our, our sitting down and uh, or attending a certain event and, and then the meal the main meal itself that which kind of kind of gets us over to that point where we're able to engage in that which is you know the, the full meal um, and the, uh, tasty, tasty trifles or d'oeuvres that that which was easily consumed which is once again very tasty uh, and trifles in that they don't have a lot of substance to them. Um, but they do satisfy the palate, at least for a moment. Satisfy our hunger, at least for a moment. It's very important for you and I, when it comes to spiritual things, to be aware of tasty trifles because he says about this, the words of a talebearer or gossip or somebody who whispers and shares, you know, just little bite-sized nuggets of interesting, titillating information. Those, those things are, are the tasty trifles he's talking about. Those words, they go down to the inmost body. They get inside of us and they excite something in us. And there's a real temptation that we have to resist uh, uh, to, to make a meal out of tasty trifles. Uh, there's a real temptation that we have to resist to give an ear to and a heart to those words, those things whispered, those things that sound so juicy and so interesting that at the end of the day, don't amount to anything when it comes to substance that your soul and my soul needs uh, that comes to us from the Word of God. So little tidbits of, of truth, little nuggets of truth. And I, I had a brother say to me one time, he says, I, I'm, you know, I, I like your teaching because I, I like to get nuggets of truth. And, and I corrected him. I said, my teachings are not nuggets of truth. And a man cannot survive spiritually, nor his, can his soul prosper on nuggets. <laughs> uh, you and I, as men and women of God, we need the full meal. We need the bread of life. We need the fresh water that flows to us from Jesus Christ. He calls himself the word of God, and he calls himself the bread of life. And we know that his word is that bread. Give us this day, he says, as he instructs us to pray, our daily bread. And notice that term daily. Now we are to come before the Lord and sit down before him to be still and to be focused that we might be fed the, the meat and potatoes, so to speak, of the word of God. And to not be caught up in the tasty trifles, the, that which sounds so interesting, that which titillates out interest, that which appeals to any appetite in us, 
for anything other than the fullness of God because we can end up uh, making meals out of those things which simply do not have the, the nutrition, the power, the inner gale, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And we must avoid that. And as I said, Solomon tells us that twice. The words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles. Oh, they taste so good going in at that little hors d'oeuvre there and that little hors d'oeuvre there. And, and, and sometimes we get fooled into thinking that we can make a meal out of those nuggets. But you cannot. The Lord did not come to serve you tasty trifles. He came to serve you and to give you his son, Jesus Christ. The full counsel of God's word is found in Jesus. And we must discipline ourselves to sit down at the table daily and to enjoy the fullness of what God will share with his children if we will only be seated and we will only eat. I remember uh, uh, joining a church where God was uh, intent on, on doing some, some really wonderful things in and through me in that church. And, and, uh, and he told me, he spoke a, a word to my spirit. He said, Eric, eat everything. Eat everything. And I believe it's very important for us to be part of fellowship and sit under the kind of teaching that feeds the, 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 the soul with the things of the spirit, that feeds us the, the, the bread of life. Uh, uh, and, and the bread and the cup, the communion is a, is a picture of that. The bread and the cup is, is the fullness of, of God's uh, uh, his, his menu for you and me. The bread and the cup, the bread representing, as you know, the, the broken body of Jesus Christ through which we enter in all the things of God and the cup representing the blood that he shed, which washes us clean and makes us eligible to be called sons and daughters of God. Now, if we fill ourselves on tasty spiritual trifles or tasty trifles of, of, of whatever the, whoever the communicator is, then, then we will feel full, but we will not be. And we will be what I call a, a living on fumes uh, when it comes to spiritual things. Instead of the fullness, the, the full vigor uh, uh, of, of what it is that God would do with us if we will set ourselves, be rooted and grounded in his house, in his word, and in the closet of prayer. So the Lord is doing something in us, and he's doing that which cannot be supported by, cannot be supported well by um, tasty trifles, snacks, so to speak, in the spirit. A little here, a little there, a little from this teacher, a little from that church, a little from that ministry, a little from these worshipers, and, and, and think that somehow or another that all those things are going to come together and make the kind of healthy, healthy, give us this healthy sustenance that we need to be and do all God has called us to be and to do. You and I need to find ourselves rooted and grounded where God would set us and dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness in that place. Feed on his faithfulness. Not on the tasty trifles of whatever messenger decides that this is what they're going to serve us, but on the message that is given to us that is rooted and grounded in the instruction that God gives us in the scriptures and given to us through uh, what, what Paul shares with us in Ephesians 4, 11, through the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers that God has ordained to feed us and to lead us in a way that we would not be blown by every wind and doctrine that comes by, but that we will be rooted and grounded and solid and mature in the things of the Lord, because we don't settle for the tasty trifles of the world, but we settle only for, we sit down and we settle at the table of God where he has invited us, given us a place, and we eat to the fullness of the Spirit so that we can be the fullness of what God would have us to be in this earth, the testimony that he would have us to have, the light that he would have us to shine, uh, the grace that he would have us to live and to show it, to live in and to show. So I encourage you to be small, be quiet, be still, to sit down where God has placed you, to not be all over the place and to not be receiving the voices um, that speak with the authority that God has truly not given them or he's not given them that authority in your life. You be rooted and grounded and seated under the pastor that God has given you. You be rooted and grounded and seated under the teaching that God has given you through that pastor. Be rooted and grounded so that you are not trying to survive this life on tasty trifles, which so many are doing today and I want to talk about that somewhat. So the, the Lord gave the children of God and gives the children of God the Word of God. So why are so many who call on his name caught up in fruitless, dishonest, and destructive noise from the world? Yeah, yes, many Christians 
believe that their obsession with politics and political figures, with cultural wars and conspiracy theories are legitimate concerns worthy of the, their energy and attention. But nothing could be farther from the truth. <laughs> Solomon exposes that type of foolishness by rightly pointing out the temptation we all face to entertain a variety of voices, those who claim to have a deeper and higher knowledge of things than the rest of us, and those who are skillful in offering us those tasty trifles I've been talking about that titillate our senses and our curiosity. Yet that's exactly the trick that Adam and Eve fell for in the garden when they entertained Satan's take on the things that God has so clearly expressed. Did God really say? That's what Satan asked them. Did God really say this? Yes, God did really say that. But when we begin entertaining uh, voices uh, that, that, and, and allowing those voices a place in our ear uh, that bring a doubt or maybe another take on what God said so that we are actually entertaining the question, is that what God really meant? Is that what God really said? Did he really say not to eat of, 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 of the fruit from that tree? Yes, he did really say that. And he did really tell Adam and Eve that the day that they ate from the tree, from this particular tree, the tree of the knowledge of, 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 of good and evil, that they would die. He did really say that. But here it is, Satan bringing doubt on that. Is that what God really meant? Oh, well, yeah, he did say that. But what he really was saying was that, that, that he didn't want you to have what he has. He didn't want you to be a God like he's God. Because once you eat of this, your eyes will be open. Beloveds, it is good to enjoy the revelation that God gives us and leave the things to which God has not shown us to him. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says this. It says, the things that are hidden are the Lord's, but the things that are revealed are ours and our children's, that we might do, that we may obey what God has given to us in the law. God reveals things to us that we might be pleasing to him, that we might walk in the things that he has shown us. God has hidden some things from us because those are things that he has chosen to keep within himself, his own counsel. Even Jesus said, I don't know when I'll be returning. Only my father knows that. And even Jesus himself, who is God, said that he has given that to his father and his father has kept that to himself. And then when the father tells Jesus to return is when he'll return and not until. And Jesus humbled himself before that reality. You and I need to humble ourselves before the reality that God has revealed certain things to us and God has hidden certain things from us. So when those people come to us uh, uh, to tell us about all these hidden things, all these things that are going on behind the scenes, all these things that, that we would not know unless they themselves made us aware. Be, be, a, uh, be cognizant of the fact that that's how Satan works. Satan always wants you, uh, um, your attention to be on those things which God has not shown you. And he's always telling you, I can show you something different. Look at this, look at this side, think about this. And, and, and th these are the kinds of voices that have found far too much of a home in the hearts and minds of Christians, people that you know and people that I know. And it enters through the portal of politics and enters through the portal of, of, of cultural concerns and enters through the portal of, of this, uh, uh, this uh, adherence to the belief that our Christian liberties and our Christian rights are somehow or another being threatened by the world and by people who vote or believe differently than we do and, and that they're evil and that we're good and that there's this conspiracy and some of us, some of you just don't know about this and, and, and so let us tell you about this and, 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 and they're evil and we're good and there's a lot of that going on in today's church, in the American church today. And some of it has gone very, very mainstream, or it has colored and painted that which we would consider mainstream. And I want to talk a little bit more about that because I think it's important for us to recognize these things and to reject these things because these are things which the Lord has spoken to us about very clearly and which Solomon is speaking to us about very clearly when he talks about the tasty trifles that like to get down, they, they, I mean, they taste so good and it's so easy to just consume a lot of it and all of a sudden be filled with that kind of thing. But that kind of thing will produce bad fruit in us. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that. So here we are uh, in a world where 
Many professing believers are under the sway of the same lies and the same deception as those who don't even claim to know God. You see, when Christians buy into these things, we lend it a legitimacy that it does not otherwise have. That's why we always have to be careful about how we use our witness because our witness is our influence and, and our testimony is our influence. And if we fall short uh, of, of the fullness of walking in the things of the Lord and we lend ourselves and we lend our energy and we lend our resources to that which is not from God, somehow thinking that the end justifies the means, then we legitimize uh, the lies of the devil. That's actually what we're doing. We, we legitimize the, the, the worldly mindset um, that we are called to step away from and to, and to reject completely so that we can walk in the fullness of the things of the Spirit. That's very important. Yeah, these tasty trifles, they're hard to resist. Sometimes they're even hard to recognize. Especially when we open our hearts and minds to them. Now I want to talk about a prescription here. What do we do? What would God have us to know in the light of these things that we're talking about? Frankly, the American church is word poor. Let's, let's just be honest about that. I think any, um, any respectable survey uh, will reveal that the vast majority of us have a very, very passing uh, relationship with God and His Word. Most of us do not read the Word often or daily or anything near that. Most of us, most of us have a, a, uh, a baseline of, of knowledge, which is not the end of anything, but the beginning of everything. Most of us believe, but believing is not only the only thing that matters. Believing is the beginning of things in the spirit, not the end of things. It's the beginning, not the end. So being a believer will get you but so far. And if in being a believer, we don't apply ourselves to the one in whom we believe, we set ourselves up for the enemy to be able to come in and be able to confuse us and to be able to get our attention on other things simply because we do not know God in the Word and, 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 and the Word of God enough to recognize the wiles and tricks of the enemy. Relationship is everything in the Christian walk. And relationships, if they're important to us, they are what we pay attention to. Now, I can tell what's most important in your life when it comes to relationships by who and what you pay attention to. And if God is as important in your life as we profess, then we should be able to tell uh, by our works. And when I say our works, I, all, I, all I mean by that is being open to the Holy Spirit and how he would lead us in this walk. And one of the things he will do certainly if you're walking in the Spirit, He will instruct you and He will lead you in, in fierce attention to the Word of God, fierce attention to the closet of prayer, and fierce attention to, to the house of the Lord. I've never met a Christian uh, of any maturity to speak of whatsoever who wasn't a vital member of a local church or, and who wasn't vitally connected to God by paying attention to His Word and who wasn't vitally connected to God in a prayer life. And that is why so many in the American church are so easily fooled by that which is, which is, which is obviously uh, a political and obviously that of, 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 of a worldly agenda. But they're able to weave themselves into the fabric of the church because so many of us don't have enough word in us to ward it off. And that's why I'm sharing these things today. See, so many Christians hearken to the wildest messages delivered by the most undisciplined and unsavory of messengers simply because they do not read or heed the word of God. They do not possess a sufficient knowledge of the truth that is lavished on us in the scriptures. Um, a, a, anyone who, who knows me knows that I, that I read the, the Proverbs, for instance, daily. There are 31 chapters in the Proverbs, and there's one that corresponds to each day of the month, and, and I focus on that. And, and, and uh, I share regularly with those who, who walk with me in this, in this discipline uh, what God is saying to me according to his wisdom because I believe it's important for us to not only read the word of God and receive it but to process it and to be able to say these things back to ourselves and say these things back to each other uh, it, because that displays an understanding of what was said to us. Have you ever dealt with a child and you said something to a child and you wanted to make sure that they knew what you meant and what you were saying and you asked them to repeat what you just said so you knew that for themselves that they receive what was said and they understood what was said and they can express the expectation. Well, that's what God expects from you and me. 
He expects that kind of investment in his word where not only are we reading the word of God and we believing the word of God, but we are expressing the word of God in our lives and in our words and in our doings so that God knows that we get it. Now see, when we don't do that, the enemy is able to come in and take that space that the word of God should occupy and fill it with tasty trifles. Fill it with things that, uh, about politics, and, and I want to speak about politics in particular right now because that is uh, the, the portal that, that the enemy has, has moved into the Church of Jesus Christ in America and has set up a stronghold. And that is obvious. It is, it is impossible to miss that. And it is impossible to disagree with it because it is obviously true that the evangelical church and the Catholic church and, and, and the, the church in general, um, and we can include, we include other groups, um, have been overrun and overwhelmed uh, from our teachers forward, have been overrun by that which is political and that which has nothing at all to do with the counsel of God, but has everything to do with the waywardness and the selfishness of, of, of uh, uh, wayward thinking and the selfishness of those who are enjoying the, the tasty trifles and the benefits they seem to bring. But beloved, at the end of the day, that's a bitter harvest because there's not the nourishment, there's not the fullness, there's, 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 there's not the heft of the word of God and the things of God in the tasty trifles that so many are, are enjoying and so many are sharing today. Uh, I remember not long ago, just a couple of weeks ago, watching a particular preacher, uh, 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 this is a female preacher, she was preaching and she was declaring the things of God and the word of God as it pertained to the election. And she was saying the same thing over and over again and banging her hand and declaring and declaring and calling on angels from other continents and those types of things. And as I heard that, I said to myself, I read the Bible daily and the Bible is filled with prayers. That is not prayer. The way that you know a, a false message and a false messenger is they declare spiritual things, but those things are not at all spiritual. And the way that you know that they're not at all spiritual and they're not spiritual things at all is because you spend your life in the house, in the word, in the closet of prayer. Why? So that you might know the difference. You might know the difference. Jesus put it, puts it this way. You will know them by their fruits. And when even their prayers and it'll bring confusion and, and leave you scratching your head and walking away thinking, what was that? Well, if you want to know what prayer really looks like and sounds like, you read your Bible daily. And the Bible is filled with prayers, filled with men and women who offer up prayers to God that are acceptable prayers. And God defines prayer himself. Jesus defined prayer himself, told us how to pray, and he told us not to pray. He told us that vain repetition, for instance, which, which that woman uh, engaged in, uh, is, is foolishness. It is not prayer, and the Lord will not receive it. So, beloveds, it is important for you and me to be able to discern the spirits, discern these voices, discern their agenda, and to discern where it is that if we follow this, where we will end up. And we will end up in a place that is far, far short of where God would have us to end up. So, voices that produce disputes and confusion and arguments and heated controversies, character assassinations, conspiracies, they have no place in the dialogue of God's people, in the conversation he expects us to have. No place. Give them no place in your conversation. Finally, I want to read you some scriptures uh, that, that, that I think will, will, will help in, in our understanding and receiving this, is which means share with you today. In Romans 16, 17 and 18, Paul tells us, these words. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Also in 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 20, Paul says, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. And finally, in Titus chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, we're told, But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. 
reject the device of man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning and self-condemned. But yet I, I, I watch the church receive and prop up and promote divisive people and contentious people and people who speak uh, evil of authorities and evil of everyone else who uh, does not think and believe and behave as they would have them. I watch the church embrace this kind of thing, especially today. And I, I, I want to say boldly, and I want to say to you boldly, that that is not of God that is so far from the Lord. And it is hurtful to watch how far so many who claim to be Christians, who, who, who claim to be believers, um, fall so far of the counsel of God and is given to us in our word and has accepted the counsel of men and women who have no testimony for God whatsoever. None at all. But yet there are those of us who see and understand and recognize and resist those tasty trifles. Uh, even in areas where we believe that we're right, the fact that I believe that I'm right about an issue does not give me the permission to, to, to declare that as God's righteousness. We wait on the Lord. And we understand um, that he is in control of all things. And he is, uh, it, is, it is a dangerous thing and an unwise thing for us to consider anything's going on in the world without the, the, the reality of God being in control of all things. So uh, we, we work hard not to get so overwrought and worked up over things that are going on in the world and listening to the voices that are overwrought and overworked as it pertains to things in the world. And we look to the Lord and we rest in his peace that he is in control of all things. No matter who's in the White House, no matter who's in the State House, no matter who's in City Hall, and no matter who's in, in any other place of authority, that our God reigns. And when he does, we will recognize the voices that confirm that truth. And we will recognize the voices who are promoting their own truth and wanting to convince us that it is God's truth. That is the wisdom that you and I have to have going forward in this day because the scripture tells us that in the last times two things the love of many will wax cold and it also tells us in the last times that even the elect will be fooled if possible we have to be so connected to God in his house and in his word and obedience uh, to, and, and in prayer that we cannot and will not be fooled by any other voices by any other agenda by the way God doesn't have an agenda Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no agenda found in him whatsoever. He came to do the Father's will, and that's what he left you and me here to do, the Father's will. I want to finish with this. Be prepared to recognize and reject the tasty trifles offered by those with their own spiritual agenda. They will woo you with the promise of insight into otherwise hidden things things that will always reflect well on them and poorly on others. All those things just amount to gossip and slander and dishonor and conspiracies, and those things can have no place in our hearts and our testimonies and in our churches. No place. May the Lord give us wisdom and discernment in these things, because in today's world, we need it. Beloved, God bless you, uh, and remember Jesus Christ is Lord and King, and he is the full counsel of the Lord. Anything that is shared with us uh, as authoritative knowledge must first be found in the Word of God. So bless you. I look forward to um, seeing you on Sunday morning, and I want to thank you for uh, your faithfulness and your support for this ministry, your financial support, and your prayer support. Those things are very, very important as we will uh, continue to do everything that we can to bring you uh, good praise and worship that will cause you to lift your hands and hearts to the Lord. And, and so it is, it's just very important for us that you get the full counsel of God from this ministry and, uh, and that our voices will be those that commend you to the Lord and, uh, and to bring you joy uh, in, the, in the presence and in the power and in the counsel of the Holy Spirit. That is so, so necessary for you and for me today. So as we pay close attention to the Lord, uh, let's walk together in victory, giving him the glory he deserves. And uh, once again, I look forward to seeing you on Sunday morning. God bless you. Until then, until then, uphold that bloodstained banner. It's what's most important. God bless you. I love you. Bye-bye. Because there's something that you need to know. Jesus.